Hey y'all, Data Guy here, and today I have yet another video in my kind of best practices system or series. This time, talking about the best practices you need to know for running Apache Flink in production. Um, if you're not already aware around the basics, you know I have some other videos kind of covering that. Um, but this is really going to be a guide on how you can run Flink applications reliably at scale, because Flink requires a lot of careful configuration and management for production deployments. Because with distributed computing, even small misconfigurations can really tank the entire system's overall performance. So that's what we're going to get into today. Show you how you can set up your Apache Flink environments to make sure they're running as efficiently and effectively as possible so you're getting the most out of that very expensive compute um, and i hope you enjoy these videos if you do please like and subscribe consider joining my patreon but without further ado let's get into it so the first area i want to discuss is you know kind of the most foundational which is the infrastructure and deployment strategy for Flink. Um, and this piece is really crucial for building you know that solid foundation for that long-term operational success but it should also be based on you know, existing infrastructure, team expertise, and you know, specific requirements. Obviously, the best thing is going to be a standalone cluster that will live you know, entirely separately from any other systems um, because that offers you the most control in scaling the Flink, uh, re Flink environments up and down, gives you dedicated resources for Flink and predictable workloads. Um, and this also allows for the really fine-tuned configurations you need to run Flink effectively and eliminates the possibility of resource contention with other frameworks. So that's what you're seeing in this example is, you know, you have, hey, some front-end application that's producing your data, and then Flink is running on a completely separate cluster that's actually ingesting that data and then running it through Flink. Right. <clears throat> and this means, you know, you have, hey, Flink isn't working right. I know there's some issue with Flink. It's not some other service. Um, and, you know, allows you to also scale that individual cluster up and down based on how much data you need to process. Um, and another option, um, you know, is Yarn for organizations that are really invested in Hadoop ecosystems. Yarn is an excellent integration path. Um, and if you can't, you know, have a separate Yarn, Hadoop or separate Flink cluster, this will allow you to have, you know, dynamic resource allocation and allow Flink to coexist with other big data frameworks but introduces a lot of additional complexity in debugging and understanding, you know, requires you to understand both Flink and uh, Yarn resource management models. So in my opinion, it's a little bit too much complexity. So definitely my advice is, you know, go towards Kubernetes, especially if you're in a cloud native environment, because you're gonna have much better container orchestration, much better scaling mm -hmm. capabilities, and also just better integration with modern DevOps tooling. Um, so it'll allow you to, you know, develop and maintain your Flink environment a lot better. Um, and there's a native Kubernetes integration too in most recent Flink versions. So it makes it even more attractive for people that are already deploying with container tech. Um, and when you're deploying a Kubernetes, consider using stateful sets for job managers to make sure you're, you're ensuring proper leader election and state management as well. Um, and then another thing you're gonna wanna think about for, especially for production environments is high availability. Um, you know, on lower environments, it doesn't really matter as much, but when you're in a production environment, you wanna have uh, multiple instances of your components. So, you know, your job manager, uh, which is that you know, coordination center of Flink applications needs to be configured for automatic failover to a DR setup. Um, and this will require external coordination systems like Zookeeper, or you, know, you can use native Kubernetes mechanisms for failover. Um, but the key thing is this high availability setup should include proper storage configuration for persistent job metadata and recovery information so that you can continue running uh, without any interruption and without any loss of data. Um, and here you typically want to plan for at least three Zookeeper nodes in different AZs to ensure quorum during any kind of partial for a failure like I just described. Now, the next area you're going to want to think about when setting up Flink is resource management. Um, and the key to successful memory configuration is avoiding both under-provisioning and over-provisioning. Under-provisioning leads to out-of-memory errors and job failures, while over-provisioning wastes resources and increases costs. So start with conservative estimates for all of your nodes based on your state size and throughput requirements, then adjust based on monitoring data. Um, and this is because you know effective resource management in Flink means you need to understand the memory model and how different components, and you can see all the different components of Flink here, 
um, utilize different system resources. Uh, the task manager memory is divided into several regions and these each serve very specific purposes. Uh, there's framework heap memory, um, which actually is handling Flink's internal data structures, while task memory, uh, heap memory is allocated for user code execution. Um, and then managed memory serves batch operations and state backends like RocksDB and network buffers that facilitate data exchange between tasks. Um, and parallelism, will also significantly impact both performance and resource utilization. Um, you know, your default parallelism will reflect your typical job requirements, but individual operators will need to be tuned based on their computational complexity and data volume. Um, so source and sync operators typically benefit from different parallelism levels than processing operators because they can handle more um, because each of those operations requires much less compute power than a processing operation. So considering or consider partitioning your input data when you're setting that source parallelism um, and ensure sync parallelism aligns with, you know, whatever your downstream system's capacity is to actually ingest that data uh, at once through many different threads. Um, and then task slot configuration can determine how many parallel tasks run on each task manager. If you set it too high, you're going to have resource contention and degraded performance levels while setting it too low will waste resources, of course. And so for CPU intensive workloads, you might want to think about aligning task slots with available CPU cores. So, you know, two cores, two slots. Um, but for IO intensive workloads, you can often run more slots than cores. Um, but you just, that's something you're kind of want to monitor and adjust the memory allocated, um, adjust the parallelism based on whether you see your jobs, you know, over or under consuming resources as they're running. There's no kind of one size fits all approach because there's no one size fits all workload. Now, the next thing I want to talk about with Flink best practices is state management best practices because that's something that's key uh, for streaming processing applications as state management is going to allow you to make sure you're only processing each piece of data once. Um, and also, you got to make sure you're choosing the right state backend for application performance and scalability because there are a few different options. Uh, the heap state backend is probably the fastest performance for small state sizes, but it's limited by JVM heat memory because it's just, you know, kind of attached JVM storage. Um, and it's suitable for applications with state sizes under gigabyte where low latency is the most critical thing. But it's going to require careful garbage collection tuning to avoid long pause times when data starts to back up because there just isn't anywhere else to go. Um, RocksDB state backend is the recommended and probably the most common choice for production applications with large state requirements. Um, it will store local state um, on disk, local disk, and then handle state sizes far exceeding available memory in that state backend. Um, and it also has a built-in incremental checkpoint feature, so you can automatically, you know, just by enabling RocksDB, reduce checkpoint times and network traffic for applications with large state. Uh, but RocksDB will require a careful tuning of its internal parameters like block cache size, right buffer configuration, compaction settings to achieve optimal performance. Um, another thing you're going to want to think about just kind of as uh, a process is state time to live. Um, and this is essential for you know, preventing unbounded state growth. So make sure you're configuring TTL based on your business requirements, considering both the semantic correctness of your application and resource constraints. And this is basically the time, you know, state takes to go from collected until actually live and processed. Um, and this cleanup strategy should balance between, hey, eager memory cleanup for memory efficiency and lazy cleanup for reduced comp computational overhead because cleanup does require compute. Um, and for if you're running the Rocks DB backend, compaction-based cleanup is often the most efficient uh, approach where you compact long-lived uh, state into just, you know, compressed, um, you know, kind of more archives type storage. Um, then if you're going to do anything like state migration, migration or schema evolution, make sure you're carefully planning and design your state objects with future evolution in mind, use version schemas or flexible formats. Um, and when you're mo modifying any kind of state schemas, ensure there's some backwards compatibility or implement proper migration logic um, and test state migration thoroughly in staging environments before production deployment so you can actually see how it'll perform. Now, the next thing you want to think about is checkpointing and fault tolerance. So checkpointing is Flink's primary mechanism for fault tolerance uh, because it, it creates consistent snapshots of distributed state where 
on failure, you have a save state written to checkpoint storage, gets restarted, that re data is then recovered from checkpoint storage so that you know, hey, we're not ever processing something twice, we're only processing the thing that actually broke. Um, and the checkpointing interval should balance between recovery time objectives, so RTO, and performance overhead. If you have really short intervals, you're constantly taking checkpoints, means a lot faster recovery, but higher overhead. While longer intervals will help you reduce overhead because you're not gonna be making so many checkpoints, but it's gonna int introduce, you know, increased potential data reprocessing during recovery because you can only recover what, what was at the last checkpoint. You can't re recover anything that happened after that checkpoint, right? Um, and checkpoint storage location also will critically impact both performance and reliability. For production environments, use distributed storage systems like, you know, object store, like S3, like Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob Storage. Those are gonna offer excellent durability and cost efficiency. Um, they might have a little bit higher latency, but it's typically not a huge issue. And when using object stores, you know, you wanna make sure you're also configuring appropriate connection pools and timeout settings to handle that occasional slowness. Um, you also will need to make the choice between aligned and unaligned checkpoints. Um, aligned checkpoints provide predictable behavior and work well for most applications, um, whereas unaligned checkpoints significantly reduce checkpoints barriers impacts on latency sensitive applications, so it won't slow things down as much, but it's gonna require much more storage space and network bandwidth because you're storing more of the actual information within that checkpoint. Um, and enabling unaligned checkpoints when you observe checkpoint barriers causing back pressure in your application might make sense. You know, you don't want to avoid those kind of bottlenecks. Um, and then also, exactly once semantics here are going to require coordination between Flink and external systems. So for end-to-end -end exactly once processing, make sure your sources support replay from specific offsets and your syncs support transactional rights um, because that two-phase commit protocol will you know, at use for exactly once syncs as latency. And so you'll want to consider at least whether at least once processing might be sufficient in your use case. Uh, you know, exactly once is going to require a lot of additional compute power to make it possibility. Now, I want to talk about Flink performance optimization strategies. Um, and performance optimization in Flink requires a systematic approach where you're identifying bottlenecks through monitoring and profiling, then applying things like, hey, network buffer tuning. Um, which will provide significant performance and improvements, making sure that you know, your network buffers are working properly. If you have insufficient network buffers, those can cause a lot of back pressure and bottlenecks and reduce throughput, while excessive buffers just sit there and waste memory. Um, so make sure you're monitoring network buffer usage. You know, if it's too high and you're just spending a lot of money on network buffers without any ba back pressure, spin the network buffers down. Um, and adjust the network, the buffers per channel and floating buffers per gate based on your job's communication patterns. Um, serialization overhead is another thing that can also significantly impact performance, especially for applications with really high message rates. Um, Flink's type system provides optimal serialization for POJOs and tuples. So if you design your data types to leverage those optimizations, your serialization overhead is gonna go way down. Um, and then for custom types, you can register them with the Cairo serializer, and then you might wanna consider implementing custom serializers for frequently used types to further get that serialization overhead down. And really avoid, try to avoid using generic types like hash map or array list directly. Instead, wrap them in a POJO for better serialization performance. Um, operator chaining also will help reduce serialization overhead and latency by running multiple operators in the same thread. Um, you know, make sure you ensure your job graph will allow for effective chaining by avoiding any unnecessary repartitioning operations. Um, but be cautious about creating overly long chains that might create unbalanced load distribution. Um, and use the disabled chaining selectively uh, feature selectively for operators with significantly different resource requirements. Um, and then finally, data skew is another common performance problem in distributed processing. Um, so try to identify skewed keys through monitoring and then implement appropriate mitigation strategies for those instances. Um, and options include there things like key salting, two-phase aggregation, or custom partition strategies. Um, and then for windowed operations, consider using sliding windows instead of tumbling windows to spread the computational load even more evenly. So now I want to wrap up this video with some common problems and how to solve them. Um, so first problem that comes up a lot is checkpoint timeouts. Um, and these indicate underlying performance or configuration issues. So when a checkpoint is consistently timing out, investigate whether the state size has grown beyond expectations, if there's back pressure preventing checkpoint barriers from flowing through the job graph, 
or if the checkpoint storage system is experiencing performance issues. Um, and solutions here will include enabling things like unaligned checkpoints, increasing checkpoint time out values, optimizing state access patterns, or upgrading storage system performance. Um, another common challenge is back pressure. Um, and back pressure is a natural flow control mechanism, um, but persistent back pressure indicates bottlenecks um, because it means that you're not able to process everything fast enough. And so identifying the source of back pressure by examining, hey, which operators are slow and why is crucial to getting to you know, the root cause and the specific issue. Um, but common causes includes insufficient parallelism, expensive computation, slow external system calls, or things like data skew. Um, and you can address back pressure by increasing parallelism for bottleneck operators, optimizing computation logic, implementing caching for external calls, or just handling skewed data through part repartitioning strategies. Another common type of issue are memory management issues, um, which will manifest typically as an out of memory error or excessive garbage collection. Um, and these problems often stem from incorrect memory configuration. Um, you might have things like memory leaks in user code or inappropriate state backend selection. Um, so try and diagnose memory issues using heap logs, heap dumps, and uh, GC logs. Um, and then solutions to fix these problems will include things like adjusting memory configuration ratios, fixing memory leaks, switching to RocksDB for larger state, or implementing state cleanup strategies. Um, and then finally, State size growth can lead to checkpoint performance degradation and increased recovery times. So make sure you're always monitoring state size trends, investigate any unexpected growth. Um, and common causes for unexpected growth can include things like, hey, a missing TTL configuration, or you've been accumulating too much late data, or you have logical bugs in state update logic. Um, implement in there, you want to implement you know, appropriate TTL policies, handle late data explicitly, and regularly audit your state usage patterns, um, and consider implementing you know, custom compaction strategy for RocksDB if you need to, to even manage uh, disk space more efficiently. Yeah. So those are all the best practices for Apache Flink that I have for you today. Hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.